steps to life is opening God's Word with you. Welcome to the Steps to Life Camp Meeting 2002. God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more abhorrent to the Lord until He will refuse to acknowledge them as His children. Stay tuned for revival and reformation messages. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you again for the opportunity that you give to us of life, health, and happiness, and for us to be here in this camp meeting and to partake of the presentations that are offered. And we pray, Father, especially now at this hour, once again, you will bless our dear sister Davis as she brings to us this next presentation. And we pray that our own hearts and our minds will be open to the truths that you have for us. Again, we thank you for your love and your blessings, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're at step number one. We were talking about God's part. God's part, what he did for us, how Jesus came and took our sins and died and went through the cross for us, the second death, and to give us the opportunity to be saved. And as we present these truths to the people, the Holy Spirit is drawing them to God. As they read about it in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is drawing them. Is there a question you want to know the page? Page 25, right at the top. I won't be reading all the quotes. I skip, but I'll keep you in, I'll keep you in touch with the pages. Just put up your hand if I don't. Uh, and so as Jesus draws us, what is our part as you sense him drawing you? What is your part? Do not resist. That comes before surrender. Because you don't even know how to surrender yet. See? Do not resist his drawing. It may take him a while to draw you to the place where you are willing to go all the way. There are many people who say, I want to be a Christian, but they're not ready for surrender. They don't even know what surrender means. And so do not resist when he draws you. As you stop resisting, then he can keep on doing the work he has to do. Now, what is his next part? He will send the Holy Spirit to convict you. Uh, we read here on page 25 at the top, close to the top of the page, all heaven is waiting the sinner's cooperation. And the only barrier that stands in his way is one which he alone can remove. His own will. No one will be forced against his will. Christ draws but never compels. And you can't even compel a child to come to Jesus, can you? You can compel them to be obedient to your rules. But you cannot compel them to come to Jesus. They have to be drawn. They have to willingly come to Christ if it's going to be a real experience. No compelling will change the heart. Pleading for them to come, yes, 
but not compelling. The Holy Spirit never compels. If we do not, this is the middle of the page, if we do not resist this drawing, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for our sins, for the sins that have crucified the Savior. We will be led into deep repentance if we do not resist. Then the Spirit of God through faith produces a new life in the soul. So it's when you come to the foot of the cross that God can produce a new life in the soul. If we do not resist. Is it easy to resist? From your own experience, is it easy to resist? I found it very easy. I didn't even know I was resisting. God knew I didn't know the way of salvation. God knew. And so for years, my conscience bothered me. Study. Study. Have you ever heard him? Study. I didn't know I was lost. Why should I spend time studying when there was so much work to do for God? That's how I felt. My husband was studying all the time. He didn't seem to find anything that I didn't have. Why should I study? You see how easy it is to resist? The last year I was in India, my conscience bothered me so much by one thing. Study. I even forced myself to order a home study course from Washington, D.C. on Bible doctrines to make myself study. And I got the course and... I knew those things. I knew the doctrines. It didn't really help me. And after a while, I just put it aside. And then we came home. And then my father cried for help. And then I knew what to study. And then I went home and started to study. But like I said, at first it was hard to stay in the Word. I had been a Seventh-day Adventist all my life. I had been a minister's wife by this time for um, 20 years. Yet I had never read Steps to Christ. I had never read Christ's Object Lessons. I grew up in a German home. We didn't have those books. We were poor. When I got married, yes, my husband had many of those books. But then, I had all the church work and my babies and what have you. No time to study. And like I said, he didn't bring us anything that made me sense my lost condition. So, why study? Work for God. But as soon as I started really studying, I discovered my lost condition. You see how God was trying to help me? He knew I was a foolish virgin. I didn't know. And so if you are being prompted to study, listen. If you don't, you are resisting the Holy Spirit. It's easy to resist. There are many other ways of resisting when he asks us to give up something. As we start really listening, he will convict us. What will he do first? He will convict us of sin. We're on page 26 now. 
He will convict us of sin. What else? Of righteousness and of judgment. Now, any time I did a little sin, like a little cheating, I had to make it right. I knew I had to make it right. I was very easily convicted of sin of that kind, of an act. But I wasn't convicted that I didn't have righteousness. What is righteousness? Living the character of Christ. Living the fruits of the Spirit. And nobody talked about those things. We just talked about obedience and outward behavior. And so I was not convicted that I had no righteousness. Because I was a good, obedient girl. But I had resentment. I had impatience. I had irritation with my children. I didn't have righteousness. And now as I was reading and studying, I was convicted. And I acknowledged to my children, I didn't have God's love controlling me as I was raising you. I have failed. I didn't have God's righteousness. I acknowledge to my husband. I have had resentment toward you. I am wrong. I have no right to resent anyone. You see, as I was convicted, what did I do? I acknowledged my guilt. I acknowledged my guilt. That's our part when the Holy Spirit convicts us. Acknowledge your guilt. Is that easy to do? No, it isn't. My father couldn't do it. All those years, he didn't acknowledge his guilt. Always blamed it on others. And then I was convicted, I am not ready for the judgment. I didn't have righteousness. I didn't have the fruit of the Spirit. So then I had to do something about it. Just to share with you my father's experience of finally acknowledging his guilt. That day that I came home from India, 1970, and uh, the family, most of the family was there, and we were talking about what is righteousness by faith. At the end of the day, uh, some of my brothers and sisters said they, they were already searching. They were already beginning to find the first glimmers of righteousness, and they were deeply repenting. And so they said, let's all kneel in a little circle here, and let's confess to one another where we have wronged each other and make everything right so there's nothing between. And uh, so there we knelt. And as we were praying, one of my sisters, right next to Father, she looked up at him hoping he would confess how deeply he had wronged her. He couldn't do it. She didn't say a word, but he knew. Why? Because he was guilty. And he couldn't, he couldn't do it. And he jumped up and he ran outside. Now he's 78 years old, has a heart problem, could drop dead any time. He ran outside and I jumped up and ran after him to protect him from himself. Because I knew from childhood that if father had to take the blame for anything, he would threaten to kill himself. He couldn't take the blame. It had to be someone else's fault. You see, when you're so full of guilt, some more guilt crushes you. And so you can't do it. I caught up with him outside. It was dark. I put my arms around his neck. He's no taller than I. 
and I held him tight. And we stood there for a few moments, and I prayed, Lord, what do I tell my father? And the Lord gave me these words to say, Dad, the reason that you get so uptight when all of us children come home for a visit is because you are so afraid we are going to talk about our childhood. You have so deeply wronged your children. The only one you have not wronged is me. He thought for a moment, and then he said, Margaret, I have wronged you too. What was he doing? Acknowledging his guilt, which he could never do before. Then he took me into his bedroom, and he just poured out his soul. The guilt just came out by bucketfuls. What can I do, Margaret? What can I do? The guilt is crushing me. He said, I've gone. I've been rebaptized two years before you came home. It didn't take away my guilt. Why? Because no one knew how to lead him to the foot of the cross. That's why. He had never known how to come in full surrender. No one had taught him the way of salvation. And he told me, guilt of his childhood, of his youth. And then he cried for help, and I couldn't help him. I had not been to the foot of the cross either. I didn't know how to lead a sinner there. And I had to leave him in that condition. Until four years later, when the Lord sent me back. Only, the Bible says, only acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God. If you keep blaming others, can God forgive you? No, he can't. He can't. Because you haven't acknowledged that you were to blame. You see? Is it easy to put the blame on someone else? When you're having an argument and you get upset with each other, is it easy to blame the other person? Absolutely. It's the easiest thing to do. We can't do it if we want salvation. If my spirit goes wrong, no matter what my husband does, no matter what my children do, no matter what anyone does, if my spirit goes wrong, who is to blame? I am. I am. I can't blame one other soul. It's my fault. I didn't submit to Jesus and let him control me. That's the problem. And so I, he realized for the first time his undone condition, his really undone condition. And I had to come to that too when I studied. As we, it says here in, on page 26, the, a little further down the page in dark letters, the guilty know just what sins to confess that their souls may be clean before God. Jesus is now giving them opportunity to confess, to repent in deep humility. Those who have not humbled their souls before God in acknowledging their guilt have not yet fulfilled the first condition of acceptance with God. My father had not fulfilled the first condition of acceptance with God, even though he had been an Adventist all his life. 
because he put the blame on other people. The only reason, the bottom of the page, the only reason that we have not remission of sin, what does that mean, remission? Taking away, not just forgiveness, taking away of sin, remitting it, taking it away. The only reason that we have not remission of sin is that we have not acknowledged to him whom we have wounded by our transgressions, whom we have pierced by our sins, that we are at fault and in need of mercy. We are at fault. You cannot blame one other person in this world for your sins. Your wrong attitude. You can't. The confession that is the outpouring of the inmost soul will find its way to the heart of infinite pity. You don't have to take the guilt of other people's sins. Just your own. Just your own. But the Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Come to Christ just as you are. Contemplate his love until your heart is broken. Because God only accepts a broken heart. How do you get a broken heart? Contemplate his love until your heart is broken. So if you want a broken heart, spend much time with Jesus at the foot of the cross. Like Ellen White says, especially the latter portion of his life. What he went through to save you. He will give you repentance. You see, as you acknowledge your guilt, then he can do the next step. He can give you repentance. How can he give you repentance for your sin if you put the blame on someone else and don't acknowledge it as yours? How can he do it? He can't. His hands are tied. And it may take God many years to bring you to repentance because you're not acknowledging your sins. You're putting the blame on others. But once you come, then he can quickly work to cleanse you and to save you. And so he will give you repentance, real heart sorrow for sin, where you can go and say, I am wrong. I failed my God. And not blame others. Repentance means sorrow for sin and turning away from it. Such heart sorrow, you don't want it anymore. That's true godly repentance. The Bible says, page 28, top of the page, Proverbs 28:13. He that covereth his sins, you can say it with me, shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confess and forsake. Here, Lord, here's my sins. How do you forsake the sins of the heart? It's easy to say, forsake the worldly sins. Walk away from television that is wrong, walk away from smoking and drinking and all of those things. We can understand that. What about the sins of the heart? Resentment and bitterness and anger and envy and strife. How do we walk away from those? It's not as easy. Go to God and give him the right control you. 
give him the right to all those sins. That's what I did. Because you are going to die to sin. And you're going to come alive to God. And so this is where death to sin is to take place. Right here at the altar of sacrifice. Christ is able to save to the uttermost all who come to him in faith. He will cleanse them from all defilement if they will let him. If they will let him. And so here is the point where you have to say, Lord, here, I am letting you. I give you my right to resent anyone who hurts me or does anything that I don't like. I give you my right to resentment. I give you my right to have bitterness. I give you my right to sin. I don't want sin in the heart. And you mention especially the ones you have problems with. I want only Jesus to work in my heart. Here, Lord, here is my sin. Here's myself. Because you are yielding your will as you give up your right to act by the lower nature, you see? The whole heart must be yielded to God. Or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. Can God give you a new heart if you don't give him the old one? No, he can't. He can't. You see? So this is a very big step. Confess and forsake your sins. And if you're not ready to go all the way, the Lord will work more and more to bring you to repentance. He'll plead with you to study like he did with me until you understand what is involved. He doesn't want you to be lost. He wants to save you. And the foolish virgins didn't know that they weren't, that they didn't have Christ in them. The lukewarm didn't know they didn't have Christ in them. But the Lord was working and if they were only listening, they would have realized just like I did. That he tried to wake them up. But they put it off and put it off. The whole heart must be yielded to God or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, the surrendering of all to the will of God requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. The soul must submit. Not just give up the world, but the heart. Surrender of the heart. Surrender of the will. Then God takes your old heart. He cleanses you, gives you a new heart, gives you, he renews your will, the bent to sinning is changed of the mind, and then he restores you. He gives you a new heart and a new mind. That's what happens at the foot of the cross. That's what happens when you are justified. The Bible says, put off your old nature. This is Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new nature, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. How is the new heart made? Through creation. A new creation. The Bible says, a new creature, it is done by God. It is a supernatural work that only God can perform. How long does it take God to create something? He speaks the word 
and it can be done. How long does it take him to bring you to surrender? That depends on you, right? That depends on you. It doesn't have to take long, but usually it does. Number one, we don't understand what it means. And number two, we're not willing to listen. Most of us haven't understood what it meant. We thought we were surrendered. The consecration must be entire. God will admit of no reserve, no divided sacrifice, no idol. All must die to self and to the world. All must die to self and to the world. That's why the Bible says in Romans 6:11. Yet reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're going to die to sin and come alive to God. That's what's involved. If you are dead, I mean really dead here, and your husband comes to you and he says nasty things about you, what will you do if you are dead? Nothing. You're dead. You see? That's what it's talking about here. Dead to sin. Dead to respond in Satan's ways. Give up the right to use Satan's methods to defend yourself. That's what it means. Satan's methods are resentment and bitterness and anger and envy and jealousy and hatred. God's methods are love, patience, kindness. You see what I'm saying? Self-control. Those are God's methods. We saw it in the life of Christ. He never used Satan's methods. And if you are alive to God, what will you do if he offends you? You will forgive him. You will love him. That's what you will do. You see? Then there can be a happy home. God will not be trifled with. Christ accepts no divided service. He will not occupy a divided heart or reign from a divided throne. He demands all. That's what the Bible says in Luke 14, 33. Whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Forsake all sin. All wrong things. The Bible says Christ is the husband man. Christ, Christ is to be our husband. We are to be married. By the marriage is the union of humanity with divinity. Will God marry himself to someone who is still married to Satan? No. No. He does not share your heart. He will keep knocking at the door. He will keep loving you. He will be kind to you. He will do all kinds of nice things for you and even give you miracles. But he cannot take the throne of your heart until you surrender. He cannot. Because he will not force you and he will not share a divided heart. God and Satan are never together in the same heart. When we understand that, it will make a world of difference in our lives. Because we will know when we are yielding to God or yielding to Satan. 
cannot be both. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. The Lord cannot purify the soul until the entire being is surrendered to the working of the Holy Spirit. Empty the soul temple of all rubbish, all envying, all jealousies, all suspicions, all fault findings. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I was double-minded. I didn't know it. I thought I was serving God by doing all this work for him. At the same time, I had resentment toward my husband. Double-minded. It doesn't work. I wasn't a Christian. When we go all the way, what has he promised? This is a big step, number three. This is where entire surrender takes place. And then what has he promised? He will forgive and cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. And give us a new heart and a new mind. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When the soldier pierced the side of Jesus as he hung upon the cross, what came out? Blood and water. Two distinct streams. They both have a function. To make us right with heaven. The blood was to wash away the sins of those who should believe in his name. And the water was to represent that living water which is obtained from Jesus to give new life to the believer. We're not talking about the baptismal water. When you go down into the baptismal tank, you have already, you, you should have been already born again. And you are just giving a public testimony of what has happened in your heart. Now, if you believe it's going to happen when you go down, it could happen then. Because you have the faith to believe this is when it happens. But it should really have happened before because then you know this is what your heart experiences. Because that shows you're buried with Christ and you're rising to a new life. Two distinct streams. The blood washes away the sin. The water of life washes you into a new person. We read it in Titus 3, 5 through 8. Very important text to show you what justification does. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. How are you justified? By the washing of of regeneration. That's why Jesus said, and also there's another text that says we are justified by the blood. But remember the blood, there were two streams, blood and water. They both have a function. Cleansing from sin, washing into a new person. And that's what happens right here at the altar where the blood is shed and at the basin of water the labor. That's what that labor represents. Washing into a new person. Then you rise to walk in a new life. Now you start the life of sanctification. And the end you are judged to be righteous. Let's look at a few texts. First of all, 
in um, Mount of Blessing 114. Forgiveness has a broader meaning than many suppose. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. David, it is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. So that's what God's forgiveness is all about. Cleansing from sin, transforming the heart. David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, blood and water. Cleansing and restoration. And this is what is involved right there when you surrender to Jesus at the foot of the cross. We cannot regenerate ourselves. It is the work of God. But God has to work to bring us to the place where we surrender all. As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Holiness finds it has nothing more to require. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Do you remember when the thief surrendered? You remember? On the cross? He had been following Jesus and then he was turned away by the Pharisees. And it was then that he went into thievery. He was, he was feeling so badly that he had rejected Jesus. Read it in Desire of Ages. God allowed him to be caught. And he was there in the judgment hall with Jesus. And he walked with Jesus to the cross. And the Holy Spirit worked mightily. And finally, he surrendered. Ellen White tells us he was saved to the uttermost in that moment. Saved to the uttermost. He was ready for heaven, wasn't he? Yes, he was. His heart was new. He was cleansed from all unrighteousness. God is able to save to the uttermost in one moment if we will only yield. If we will only surrender. And we are told that that was the only bright spot for Jesus. The only bright thing that happened on his journey to the cross. All the disciples were doubting, weren't they? They were doubting. And here it was all dark around the cross. And the thief surrendered. And do you know what happened? The heavens opened and he saw his acceptance with God. Isn't that wonderful? He saw his acceptance with God. The light came down. It says that happens every time a soul surrenders, but we don't see it. But the thief saw. Why do you think God did that for the thief? Assurance, yes. You will not be tempted beyond your strength. Jesus died soon after. If he didn't have full assurance of salvation, what could have happened when all the disciples were expressing their doubts? We thought it was he. You see? But God gave him a miracle so he could keep on believing until his last breath. God is so wonderful. He wants to save us. He doesn't want to lose us. It's 
time is running too fast again. Romans 6.22. I want you to look at this verse. Very, very important. It goes through the whole plan of salvation in one verse. And I will show you how it works with the sanctuary. I'm going to read it from two versions, the King James and the Revised Standard. First of all, this is the Revised Standard. Now that you have been set free from sin, that's where that happens, the blood cleanses from all sin, and you have become slaves of God, here you are not a slave of Satan anymore, you are now a slave or a servant or a son of God, you have a new birth, the return you get is sanctification. You see, that's what you get because you have gone through this experience. This experience comes first. Then comes the sanctified life. Because you've been cleansed from sin, the return you get is sanctification and its end, eternal life. The King James says, Now that you have been set free from sin, now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and its end, eternal life. You see, now you can grow the fruit of holiness because you are now married to Christ. You are grafted in and His Holy Spirit has the right to work in you the fruit of the Spirit and it shows on the outside. And that's the life of sanctification, the life of holiness. How much sin was ever allowed in the holy place? None. None. Sin and Jesus are not in the same heart together. If Jesus stayed in your heart... While you invited sin back in, you would be destroyed. We need to realize this. Jesus never shares the throne with Satan. It says when we go back to sin, we push Jesus aside. We do it. He cannot abide. We'll go into more detail on that tomorrow. What is sanctification? We'll read a few quotes on that. It is to give oneself wholly and without reserve to God, to deal justly, to love God without regard to self or self-interest, to be heavenly-minded, pure, unselfish, holy, and without spot or stain. That's sanctification. Set apart for God's use. It's not you trying to get sin out. No. You have come to the foot of the cross. You have given him all your sins. Then he cleanses you and he gives you a new heart and a new mind and he says, go, sin no more. Isn't that what he says? Yes. And as long as you abide in him, you don't have to fall. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. It's very important. These two steps, very important. Sanctification is a state of holiness without and within, being holy and without reserve the Lord's, not in form but in truth. Every impurity of thought, every lustful passion separates the soul from God. For Christ can never put his robe of righteousness upon a sinner to hide his deformity. He never covers sin. He saves from sin, not in sin. And sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Why? Because all the rest of your life you should abide in Christ. It's abiding in Christ. That's what sanctification is. That's
That's why it's the work of a lifetime. And the thief had the work of a lifetime. After he surrendered, he was abiding in Christ the rest of his life. Walking with God. Living for God. That's sanctification. Sanctification. How many understand its full meaning? The true Christian obtains an experience which brings holiness. He is without a spot of guilt upon the conscience or a taint of corruption upon the soul. True sanctification is nothing more or less than to love God with all the heart, to walk in his commandments and ordinances blameless. Sanctification is not an emotion, but a heaven-born principle. Again, look at the vine and the branch. A heaven-born principle, the Holy Spirit, the living principle from Christ coming into the little branch. Bringing all the passions and desires under the control of the Spirit of God. That's what sanctification is. The Holy Spirit working in you to keep your spirit right. And this work is done through our Lord and Savior. Christ working in you to keep your spirit right. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I know this is new to many of you. It was very new to me when I discovered it. Because we had been brought up with this idea, sanctification is the work of a lifetime to try to overcome your sins. And maybe at the end of your life, you'll have victory. No, sanctification is living in victory. It's the work of a lifetime to abide in Christ. And tomorrow we'll talk about what if you fall, what if you stop abiding, and we'll see what happens. And now we have just a minute or so left, but this step here is very, very important. Christ has promised to do this, forgive and cleanse when we surrender. But what if we don't believe he can do it? Can he do it? No. No. According to your faith, be it unto you. How do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Spend time with Jesus if you don't have that faith. He has promised, and I know he can do it. And it, we read here, um, when, when, the, um, when the Israelites were bitten by the serpents and they cried for help, what happened to those who did not look? They died. And God let them die. Didn't he? Yes. They didn't have faith. They could have. They saw their friends leaping up and being whole. But they wouldn't believe. And they died in their sins. How sad. And so this is a very important step. Jesus told that story to Nicodemus so he would believe that he could give him a new heart. When he told him about the new birth. He told him about the Israelites. Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful, helpless, dependent. We may come with all our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and fall at his feet in penitence. It is his glory to encircle us in the arms of his love, to bind up our wounds, to cleanse us from all impurity. Here is where thousands fail. 
They do not believe that he can do that. They do not believe. Thousands fail. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to believe what Jesus can do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive our unbelief. As you have told us, the greatest sin among us is unbelief. Unbelief as to what you can do in our hearts. And Father, help each one of us. That if we don't have that faith, that we will sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him so that our faith can take hold of what you have come to do to save us. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen.